Hello and a good evening um, to everybody in this new virtual environment. This is um, and welcome to what will be the fifth annual talk um, between the Public Record Office in Northern Ireland and the Belfast Titanic Society. And it will be the second online. And hopefully next year um, we'll all meet again in person. I should like to say a big thank you to our friends from the Belfast Titanic Society um, and to Mark, who's joining us from England. Shortly, we're going to be, I'm going to pass you over to Aidan, who's a co chair of the Belfast Titanic Society, for just a couple of pieces of housekeeping. Firstly, you've all been muted on entry, and that's just to cut down on the background noise so we can all hear the speaker. In the event, um, Mark's presentation goes down. We have a copy, which we will bring into play instantly. The, this presentation is being recorded. Um, so if you don't want your um, mug to appear, can you turn on couch thing? Sorry. If you don't want your face to appear, um, please um, turn your video off. I've got a message to turn on captioning. I'm not sure. I can't do that. Maybe Lindsay can do that. Um, I'll let her check that in. But I'll now um, pass on to Aidan to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen. And it's really good to see everybody. You're very welcome uh, to tonight's talk by Mark Chernside. And thanks uh, initially to Stephen Scarth from Prony for a grand hostess, and it is indeed the fifth talk. I was going over this with Mark, and we, we couldn't believe that it was his fifth talk. And as um, Stephen says, it's his second one now online. And yes, we all aspire to have more in person events, and hopefully for next year that, that might happen. Um, I've been dying to say this now because um, Stephen um, mentioned that we, we had a uh, a backup plan and um, we've just actually confirmed that it is a very remote contingency that if we have to deal with it and that's just uh, a pun on tonight's um, title so look I'm Ed McMichael I'm co-chair of Belfast Titanic Society and um, I also have to thank uh, in prony Lindsay tonight who's in the back and she's looking after all our technology and she's going to facilitate looking in detail at the chat box and your comments and questions and lining those up for after the talk. Mark's got a great speaking record with the society uh, and Prony. Um, it actually delivered the first one back in 2017. And if you remember and were present then, it was his talk on the big four, Cedric, um, Celtic, Baltic and Adriatic. Got those right. Um, and then last year he turned um, his attention to those fascinating characters, Bruce's main Captain Smith, in his intriguing talk entitled Chairman and Commander. The lifeboats of Olympic and Titanic have long been the subject of great discussion and controversy, and it's the Harland and Wolf and White Star Line background to the safety of passenger liners and their lifeboats that gets the Chernside Star treatment tonight. So I'm not going to say any more, and I'm going to hand over to Mark Chernside. Mark, you've got to unmute. Um, right, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, I was trying to unmute myself, and it was saying you're you're not allowed to. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you can uh, all hear me now. Um, uh, thanks both. I appreciate the introduction and the warm welcome. Um, it's great after five talks that people are still coming back. Um, I remember last year I was really hoping that I'd be in Belfast in person and I somehow can't believe that um, I'm not. So hopefully we won't jinx it if I say we'll uh, see, you, uh, see you next year. Um, right, so let's just see if, uh, see if this can work. Thank you. 
CM. I'll uh, just uh, uh, turn myself off while I'm speaking, just so you can uh, see the slides. Um, right. Um, so uh, what I'm uh, hoping to do uh, this evening is just set the scene a little in terms of the context of the years uh, leading up to 1912 and just add a bit of uh, perspective really on uh, the subject of lifeboats, which is probably one of the most uh, contentious aspects of the uh, Titanic disaster. And uh, as you can see from the title, it's actually a direct quote from Harold Sanderson, the White Star Line, who says uh, that uh, uh, providing lifeboats for all would be dealing with a very remote contingency. Right, so um, regulations were quite a bit out of date, uh, even uh, in the 1880s. And um, there's a quote to that effect from Sir Digby Murray, who um, was actually a, a White Star Line um, uh, official at an earlier stage, and then he became uh, advisor to the uh, Board of Trade. And he freely admitted that the rules were entirely obsolete and that they were perfectly well aware that the rules were obsolete. Um, so in the late 1880s, uh, British government started to look at uh, changing the regulations. Um, now, what we can see here in this table is the regulations in force from 1855. Um, you can see at the bottom left, actually, the, the maximum tonnage of, uh, of a ship was 1,500 tonnes and upwards at that time. Now, to put that in context, the tender Nomadic, which was uh, built in 1911, to serve Olympic and Titanic was uh, just under 1,300 gross tons. So that helps put into context just the, uh, the size of the uh, ships that, uh, that they were dealing with. And uh, a, a ship uh, could uh, be required to carry boats for, it worked out at 216 uh, people. And um, yet they could uh, carry far more than that. You know, it might be 1,200 uh, passengers and crew in some cases. And uh, we've also got statistics about the shipping lines themselves. So this is uh, White Star's fleet. And um, if we look at the key figures here are at the bottom right. So we can see an average um, of 17.2%, uh, that was what uh, the regulations required uh, to be provided in terms of boat accommodation um, as a percentage of passengers and crew. And actually White Star provided an average of 20.4%, uh, so they're a bit in excess of the regulations. Um, it's worth noting actually White Star were at the, uh, the thin end of the wedge, if I can put it that way. So if we take the Cunard fleet, for example, um, they exceeded the regulations by quite a long way. I think it was about 39% of passengers and crew that on average they provided accommodation for versus the 19% that was required in the case of, of their fleet. And um, perhaps this was in part because of the importance they attached to uh, keeping a, a damaged ship afloat in the first place. So we've got a quote here from uh, Sir Digby Murray again. And he's referring to the White Star Line's first Britannic. Uh, she'd only been in service 13 years by 1887, but she'd already been saved twice. So on one occasion, she had two compartments flooded. And then on the uh, second occasion, she had one compartment flooded. So her watertight compartment saved her from sinking. And he emphasized, I need not tell you that there's a very great risk to life, even in smooth weather, the moment you have to lower your boats. He said that he thought uh, ships could be made perfectly safe by uh, watertight subdivision. And uh, he cited uh, Britannic as uh, an example. And in fact, in the late 1880s, uh, the British government uh, uh, initiated a series of subcommittees, uh, committees and subcommittees dealing with uh, life at sea. And uh, one of them um, actually uh, was not, it was tasked with looking uh, at lifeboats rather than construction, but uh, they uh, went rather outside, I'm oh, sorry. Uh, they went rather outside their remit and they said, well, the, the question of construction was not included in their reference terms, uh, but they said they still, still they think it only right to state, having heard the evidence that the proper placing of bulkheads uh, this is watertight bulkheads, of course, 
so as to enable a ship to keep afloat for some length of time after an accident has occurred is most important for saving life at sea and a thing upon which the full efficiency of life saving appliances largely depends. And um, there was quite a lot of comment at the time uh, on the danger of uh, uh, lowering lifeboats or having to evacuate a ship in bad weather. Um, so um, there's a further quote we can see and uh, the Committee on Saving Life at Sea, <coughs> excuse me, found that many passenger ships could not without great inconvenience carry so many of the ordinary wooden boats as would suffice to carry the whole of the passengers and crew with safety in bad weather. And they said that under such circumstances, the crew would not be sufficient to man so many boats, nor could they all be got into the water in sufficient time in the event of a very rapid foundering. Having regard, however, to the fact that accidents occur probably as often in moderate weather as in bad, and having regard also to the fact that the very cause of the accident frequently incapacitates many of the boats, and to the further fact that an insufficiency of boats undoubtedly tends to cause panic, we are of the opinion that all seagoing passenger ships should be compelled by law to carry such boats and other life-saving apparatus as would in the aggregate best provide for the safety of all on board in moderate weather. Um, and despite the, uh, the run on sentences, it must admit I find the language a bit woolly as to uh, exactly, exactly what they were recommending. Um, but anyway, reform was on the way and it was implemented in 1894. It was with the Merchant Shipping Act. Um, so that came into force and it required that ships of 10,000 gross tons and above needed to have 16 lifeboats under davits that had a capacity of 5,500 cubic feet in total. Um, that's about 550 people because they, they reckoned um, 10 cubic feet per, per person. Um, further, if these boats did not provide accommodation for everyone on board, then the additional boats or life rafts needed to be carried an additional uh, three fourths of cubic capacity. Um, there was also a rule 12, which was for ships divided into efficient watertight compartments. And in the case of those ships, the additional boats or rafts required um, was only an additional one half rather than three quarters. Um, so this, I think it was partly to encourage, uh, you know, robust construction. Um, I mean, in reality, I don't think Rule 12 was ever put into practice. I believe one ship may have been in the process of applying for it. I think it was a Cunarder and um, they, uh, they didn't proceed uh, in the end. And um, we can just see here the, uh, the, the, the scale um, and uh, you know, the, the, the maximum, of course, right at the top for um, ships 10,000 tonnes and above. Um, now, of course, by 1907, um, there were ships afloat that were three times this size, so Lusitania and Mauritania. And uh, Cunard's naval architect, Leonard Peskett, um, uh, looked back in 1912, and he, he basically said in around 1906, 1907, when the question of boat capacity uh, for these ships was brought forward, the special subdivision of these particular vessels was taken into account. And they considered that owing to the extraordinary precautions which had been taken, the total capacity of boats necessary to be carried would be fully met by the existing rules. And accordingly, Cunard uh, fitted 16 lifeboats on Lusitania and Mauritania. Now, uh, this time, of course, White Star were looking to respond. So uh, by uh, the end of July in 1908, Harland and Wolf had uh, worked through several design concepts and they're on design D. Um, this was the one that uh, Ismay and Sanderson approved at the end of that month. And uh, we can see here the boat deck. So um, it uh, envisaged 16 lifeboats uh, under davits, um, 14 were standard boats and two were smaller emergency cutters. So they'd be uh, lowered in, um, in case of uh, a person overboard, for example. And of course, by this time, these ships were projected at 45,000 tonnes, so they're again uh, much larger than the 10,000 tonnes or above seen in the 1894 regulations. Um, but one of the th key themes here is that although 
the focus tends to be on ships getting larger, but it doesn't follow that larger ships necessarily carry more people. Um, so we've got a couple of examples here. Uh, President Lincoln was built um, by Holland and Wolf for the German Hamburg America line and um, sheer capacity for over 4,000 passengers and crew. Lifeboat accommodation was for less than 1,500. Um, we've also got examples of uh, Carmania, a Cunard ship completed 1905, uh, Franconia, um, I think she was finished in 1911, and uh, of course Olympic. And uh, there was uh, the Edinburgh Castle of the Union Castle line. Actually, she came close to having uh, boats for all. She had more than spaces in her boats for more than a thousand out of about 1,100 passengers and crew. And uh, she was on the South African route rather than the, uh, the North Atlantic run. Um, so in terms of percentages, uh, President Lincoln had lifeboats for 36% of passengers and crew. Olympic was very similar at 34. And then the Cunarders, Franconia had 31%, Carmania had 29%. So even though Olympic is a lot larger, actually she doesn't necessarily carry more people and the, the lifeboat capacity is in line with uh, the uh, smaller ships. We can illustrate this as well with uh, Carpathia, just to pick a, a random random ship that you might have heard of. Of course, it uh, came to Titanic's rescue. Um, now, as of April 1912, she had uh, capacity for nearly 2,900 passengers and crew, um, and the lifeboat capacity worked out at 35%, and that compares to Olympics 34%. Now, Olympic is, uh, I think, something like three times the size of Carpathia, and yet uh, the lifeboat capacity is proportionally very similar. Um, and actually, uh, Carpathia's arrangement was inferior in one sense, because 25% uh, uh, of her passengers and crew could be accommodated in lifeboats under Davids, whereas that was 28% on Olympic. So there were quite a few lifeboats on Carpathia that uh, they couldn't readily be lowered into the water. You'd have had to move them uh, first um, uh, towards the davit so that they could be lowered. Now, uh, by this time, uh, Holland and Wolf and Alexander Carlyle in particular uh, were considering uh, the uh, arrangements of uh, Olympic and Titanic. Uh, We've got illustrations from 1909, uh, not official, I think they're in the Scientific American, which show the old fashioned radial davits um, the, on these ships, um, which very much like what I had on Carpathia. I appreciate you can't see very well, but it's just, uh, just the, the little uh, uh, tube davits uh, just here by the funnel. Um, but um, after some thought, um, Alexander Carlyle um, opted for a better design. So um, Hand and Wolf had already fitted um, some double acting Welland Quadrant davits to Balmoral Castle and Edinburgh Castle in 1909. And that enabled them to have two lifeboats uh, for each set of davits. So um, both boats could be lowered um, by the, the, the same way, one, one after the other. And um, the Welling Company um, was uh, uh, the company of uh, a Swedish designer, Ernst Axel Martin Wielin, uh, popularly known as Axel Wielin, and he patented a number of designs, um, both in uh, the United Kingdom and the United States from about 1900 uh, onwards. Uh, there was a British freighter, the Star of Japan, which uh, sank in April 1908. Uh, she had a, a combination of the older radial davits and the, the, the Welling davits. And her captain said the older davits proved useless, whereas the Welling davits helped the saving of every soul on board. So uh, fortunately, everyone was, uh, was able to uh, get off. Um, I mean, just see at the top here, there's an article in the Belfast newsletter about uh, the Edinburgh Castle, and uh, it's a bit blurry, but we can just see at the top right the enlargement. They said there's an ample supply of boats, and they referred specifically to the Welling Davits, um, which uh, they were quite uh, uh, proud of. Um, so uh, after the Titanic disaster, Alexander Carlyle gave an interview to the Daily Mail. 
and he said that when he was working out uh, the designs for these ships, he uh, got in touch with uh, Wellens and essentially got them got the company to design um, a set of davits, which would allow them potentially to place up to four lifeboats on a, a single uh, set of davits. Um, and uh, Holland and Wolf were in regular contact with White Star officials, so primarily Bruce's mate and Harold Sanderson, and uh, various key meetings were held in uh, October 1909 and January 1910. Um, and it was generally arranged that uh, Piri and Ismay uh, did the talking. Carlisle said, Mr. Sanderson and I were more or less dummies. And um, he said that in testimony at the uh, Mersey inquiry and it was a rather cutting remark uh, from Mersey. And he said that has a certain very similitude So uh, there was a meeting over about four hours in October 1909. It was held at Hand and Wolf's offices in Coxburgh Street, London, so close to White Star's offices. And uh, Carlisle put the preliminary designs before Piri and the White Star directors. Uh, he pointed out that he thought the government and the Board of Trade would soon require more lifeboats on larger ships. So it was a sort of preemptive uh, preparation. Uh, and he was authorised to go ahead and uh, get out full plans and designs so that if they did need to fit uh, additional lifeboats, there, there wouldn't be any extra trouble or extra expense. Uh, but he did say that of the four, hour meet, four hours that they met, uh, the lifeboat part took uh, five or ten minutes. So um, I, I think it was a, a very quick uh, a case of Carlisle saying, well, I propose this, and then Piri and the White Star directors uh, gave the go-ahead. And um, this helps to illustrate the uh, design of the Wellin uh, Quadrant David. So you can see at the top left, um, you'd have uh, an outer boat and an inner boat. Um, we can also see it sort of sketched out so that the first boat would be lowered overboard and then the Davits would uh, come back in to take the inner boat and they'd, uh, they'd then be able to uh, lower that one away as well. Um, and at the bottom we can see how Olympic's boat deck might have looked if they had done this. So the, the black boats were not, um, were not included on the, uh, the final design, just the uh, white uh, boats. Um, and you can see one other change here is that compared to the original design concept, they have moved the lifeboats away from the first class promenade and they put them on the officers promenade as well. So the, the first class passengers have got uh, more space. Um, but these uh, these davits prove their worth um, when a Titanic sank. Um, third officer Pittman said that he was struck at the time by how easy it was to get the boats out and the great improvement the modern davits were on the old fashioned davits. He said, I had about five or six men there and the boat was got out in two minutes. But um, they've got this great design, of course, but you, you can't simply um, fit this new design to these ships without the regulator's approval. So they had to submit a load of blueprints, a load of technical specifications to the Board of Trade in March 1910 to get the uh, regulators go ahead. And you can just see on the left, this is one of many examples. Every single element of these uh, davits had to be drawn out. Uh, they had these scale blueprints and uh, they were submitted uh, for approval. Um, now, the Board of Trade it, it eventually uh, approved the design, but um, they did have a reservation because as we can see at the bottom right here, they noted that they had double frames so that only eight boats can be put out simultaneously. Uh, this seems a very small number for such large ships and it is for consideration whether it can be regarded as complying with the spirit of the rules. Um, in the end, they, they thought it was fine and they went ahead with it. But th this is essentially that um, because the, the davits were, were double framed, you, you had a, a, a davit arm on each side and um, therefore uh, you had to lower every other um, boat as it were. And what's interesting about these documents is that there's a reference in March 1910 to 32 boats. So it says the Titanic and Olympic are each to be fitted with 32 boats, which are to be carried under 16 sets of double acting davits, eight on each side. Now, 
this is a bit odd, firstly, because they've got the names of the ships the, the wrong way round. Um, it was always referred to Olympic and Titanic, um, well, before the disaster anyway. And um, there seems to be an assumption here. Um, these davits have been submitted for approval. Um, and obviously the key feature of the design is that they can handle more than one lifeboat on, on each set of davits. But Alexander Carlyle retired at the end of June 1910. And Carlyle said that before he retired, no decision had been taken on how many boats would actually be um, supplied. So I believe that this reference to 32 boats is simply an official's assumption based on the fact that these davits could um, uh, handle more than uh, one boat per set. And this is reinforced by uh, correspondence from Axel Wellin. Um, you can just see as an enlargement at the bottom, he uses the same inversion. So he says uh, they're primarily to be used for the Olympic and the Titanic. Um, and um, it, it's not really a secret that there were blueprints produced which showed 32 boats. Um, and uh, we can take a look at them here. Um, so um, there today at the Merseyside Maritime Museum in Liverpool. Um, plans are, are quite large to reproduce on a slide. So I've just uh, produced the, uh, the, the fore end of the boat deck. But you can just see at the top, SS Titanic and Olympic. So again, you've got the ship names the, uh, the, the, the wrong way round. Um, and it uh, shows the arrangement where you've got uh, two boats uh, per um, set of davits. Um, these plans are believed to date to March 1910. Uh, one of the reasons is that if you look closely here, there isn't the first class gymnasium, whereas that did, that did appear on plans that are dated from June 1910. And the original plan was that the gymnasium would be on F deck. It was later moved to the boat deck. So that helps to confirm. Um, and um, I don't think these plans were, were widely known. I, I mean, they should have been because Carlisle um, testified that a plan had been produced that showed how um, these boats would be held by the Davits. Um, but he, he equally said that the actual number of boats to be fitted wasn't settled um, at the time he uh, retired. Um, and uh, Edward Wilding also testified. He said, I saw plans prepared for discussion among ourselves, which did show two boats under each pair of davits. And I, I think these are the plans that he was referring to. Um, there was quite a bit of uh, um, attention in the media in um, early to mid 1980s. They, they were shown on the uh, television programme Titanic A Question of Murder, which is really quite an overdramatic title. Um, and you can see at the bottom left here, there is a notation on the plans. Um, it gives the capacity of the 14 lifeboats and the two emergency boats. So this is the 16 that we see from um, the 1908 design concept, but it also includes details of 16, quote, proposed additional boats. Um, so they would have um, they provided capacity for another 800 persons, so um, a little under 1,800 uh, people in total, um, which incidentally would still have been quite a way short of the number of people on board Titanic at the time of the disaster. But um, yes, it is important to know that it, it's 32 boats rather than 16, but it, proportionally it, it's not double the capacity because the uh, the, the boats on the uh, on uh, the inside are, are smaller. Now, by June 1910, the Board of Trade wrote to Holland and Wolf and requested more information, both about the boats and the davits. Um, they Holland and Wolf submitted this information on the 30th of June 1910, which by coincidence is the same day that Alexander Carlyle retired. Um, to be quite honest, I, I don't really think there's particular any particular importance to that. I mean, we can see here, they write to the Board of Trade and refer to their letter of the 29th instant. So I think they're simply replying to a letter from the day before. And uh, Holland and Wolf submit a blueprint. Um, 
and you can see this is one Holland and Wolf have produced because they, they use the ship's yard number and um, this simply refers to Olympic, although um, undoubtedly it was intended to uh, be accurate for both ships. And uh, as we can see, of course, there are 16, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, 16 lifeboats shown. And again, we've just got the fore end of the uh, boat deck here. And uh, as I mentioned, you can uh, see that the gymnasium has been uh, added. But uh, we, we, do, we do know the exact date of the plan because uh, it is uh, date stamped. Um, now, part of, uh, there is a, a bit of a mystery to this because um, it, it shows the, the boats and the Davids, but uh, actually which, which is the more important? Well, there is a, oh, sorry, I skipped a slide. Um, there is a document that dates from August 1911 that we can see at the top here. Um, so uh, just the following year, at this time, Cunard were working out plans for their Aquitania, which was their ship that would uh, meet the competition, would, would uh, uh, try and lure passengers away from Olympic and Titanic. And she was eventually completed in 1914. But we can see here that they're saying, well, under normal circumstances, they wouldn't submit a, a boat plan to the, to the Board of Trade they would simply have fitted 16 lifeboats with the capacity and um, the local surveyor would uh, pass these as according to requirements. Um, so I think it, if that is correct, that that was the general procedure, I think it's more a case, um, although the uh, plan or the blueprint Holland and Wolf submitted on the 30th of June 1910. It does show the lifeboats and it shows the Davits, but I think really the, the, the focus is uh, a bit more uh, on the Davits, if you will. And um, we can see here at the bottom left, um, this would have been, this is lifeboat eight on the port side of the ship. So it's the aftermost lifeboat of the, of, of the ones at the fore end of the boat deck. Um, we can just see here actually that you can actually see the, the double the double frame between lifeboat eight and lifeboat six, and then there's the single frame um, at uh, the aft end. And of course, at this point, as Carlisle said, they still hadn't decided uh, how many boats uh, they'd fit. Oh, sorry, I keep doing this, I keep skipping. Um, and um, in uh, testimony, J. Bruce Ismay, the White Star chairman, um, uh, said, I, I could not say whether I did or not um, see the plans uh, that Holland and Wolf had prepared um, uh, showing the, uh, the Davits and the lifeboats. Um, he was asked, did you personally examine the designs of the lifeboats? He said he did not. Um, and he went on to say, well, he was asked who at White Star would be responsible for accepting or rejecting such a design from the shipbuilder. And he said, I never saw any such design and I do not know that anyone connected with White Star saw any such design. And uh, Harold Sanderson's testimony provides some insight into their, um, their way of thinking. He essentially said, well, I do not think it was ever in our minds that the whole ship's company of Titanic could, under any conceivable circumstances, be required to be put afloat in boats. He said that 19 times out of 20, or even 99 times out of 100, he didn't think they'd succeed in filling all those boats and, and launching them safely. He thought that the weather conditions um, on the Atlantic were um, such that he would look up upon it as a very remote contingency and uh, something to avoid at all costs. So in his judgment, it would be better to make the ship so safe that they would not have to consider the possibility of putting all the ship's uh, company into lifeboats and uh, evacuating them. And after the disaster, he was somewhat surprised at press coverage. So he uh, contacted Harland and Wolf um, and uh, he then testified he believed a, a sketch or plan was submitted um, that showed how they could be arranged for. So maybe he's referring to the plan from March 1910, 
but he said he was quite clear that White Star's manager never saw it and never heard about it. He said, I've not the faintest recollection of ever hearing a word about it. Um, and in turn, he was asked to essentially, well, what was the reason why you stopped at this number of boats? And he simply said that there was nothing more definite than they should comply with the requirements and then go a bit in excess. And again, I, I suppose it harks back to the mindset, really, and also, according to Carlisle's testimony, they only spent five or ten minutes discussing the lifeboat. So I, I think probably they, they did see it, but it didn't really make much of uh, an impression on him. And um, uh, Wilding um, actually testified uh, on behalf of Harland and Wolf. Uh, of course, um, Thomas Andrews had been lost in the disaster. He said it's possible to carry three boats in the manner that was indicated on the sketch. Um, he later corrected himself and said he realised that there were two boats on the plan. The third one is sort of a, a, a ghost outline. Um, and uh, he said the conclusion they arrived at was that it was not uh, a solution that they would want to recommend to White Star. He was asked why not, and he said that in his view the number of boats were sufficient for the purposes that they would be uh, intended uh, to be uh, used. And that White Star left these matters of detail to them as their experts. Now uh, by late 1910 there was public interest in Olympic and uh, there was actually a parliamentary question addressed to the President of the Board of Trade. Um, and he said Olympic would be provided with 16 boats. So he refers to the 14 lifeboats and then the two, um, the, the two cutters. Um, and this prompted a letter, anonymous letter from Axel uh, Wellin. And he explained that they had worked out the special patent davits for these ships. They could carry three or even four boats and uh, the, the, these are being fitted, although he said, I have personally no idea of how many boats the builders or owners are likely to fit. Um, yet the provision of such gear is the prima facie evidence of, uh, of their desire, ship owners' desire to be up to date and ahead of requirements. Uh, fast forward to early uh, May 1911. Uh, White Star approved uh, Plan 6, which was for four additional collapsible boats to be added. These were Engelhart collapsible boats ordered from uh, Scotland. Um, and uh, they were ready late in May 1911. So Olympics boats were sent 24th and 25th of May in two pairs um, from uh, the, 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 the makers, uh, McAllister and Son and uh, they were sent to Harland and Wolf and the Titanics followed uh, in February 1912, one at a time. Um, these extra boats saved Ismay's life because he uh, left Titanic aboard one of these collapsibles, Collapsible C. Now by 1911-12 things were moving along, um, so White Star was taking a decision here to add some additional boats and go further beyond uh, the regulations. By February 1912, Cunard had decided that they would fit boats for all aboard Aquitania, um, which um, I think would have uh, created some peer pressure, leaving aside the, the legal angle. Because, uh, you know, how can Aquitania have boats for all if rival ships like Olympic and Titanic uh, don't? And just to help illustrate, this is um, a, a, similar, um, a similar collapsible boat and uh, how it looked when the uh, when the sides had been uh, put up. Um, now, just to set a bit of context, um, we've got a comparison here between the original design concept from July 1908 and then Titanic as she was completed. So the number of passengers had been cut quite significantly by uh, more than 20 percent. The numbers of crew are believe this is a best estimate. Um, the 1912 figure is correct. The, the, the 18 sorry, the 1908 figure is a, a best guess, up about 7%, and overall the, the, the absolute lifeboat capacity is up by 19%, or as a proportion of passengers and crew, it's gone from 25 to uh, about 35. So that's quite a significant proportional increase. Uh, again, 20 foreign going British passenger steamers in April 1912 had an average gross tonnage of about 20,000, 
lifeboat capacity under Davids was 856 persons, which in absolute numbers is less than Olympic and Titanic. And in percentage terms, it was about 35%. So again, all this commentary about ships being larger, well, yes, they were, but actually the lifeboat capacity is uh, uh, proportionally similar to uh, smaller ships. Um, and this just helps visualize it. So we see at the right Titanic's lifeboat capacity it was above the border trade requirements in the middle. And if they'd had a rule 12 exemption, um, then that would have been significantly uh, smaller indeed. Um, now, after the disaster, uh, Alexander Carlyle got into a bit of hot water as a result of his Daily Mail interview. And he was asked, essentially, you were the chairman of the managing directors did you say, as chairman of the managing directors of Holland and Wolves, I think there ought to be three times as many boats on that deck as we are at present contemplating putting there? And he said, no, I would not say that I did. Did you think it? He thought there ought to have been. And then why did you not say so? And Carlisle said, I've always been accustomed to put the plans before the owners and letting them let them judge. Unless they ask questions, I did not give them an answer. Um, do you mean to tell me that this on, on this important matter, having formed the opinion and the matter being discussed and you being the chairman of the managing directors, you did not say that? And he said, certainly not. Um, whereas I, I think if you'd asked Ismay or Sanderson, they were, they'd probably have been of the view, well, based on their testimony, they were really reliant on the, uh, on the shipbuilders. Um, and... Um, Carlyle was also asked specifically, so if we look at the top left, did you ever say so, i.e. that more boats were needed? I've said so over and over again. To whom? He said, I've said it in the works, meaning the shipyard. And the questioner got a bit exasperated. He said, well, to whom? You do not go and talk generally to the works at large. Who, to whom did you say it? And Carlyle said he said it to the uh, Merchant Shipping Advisory Committee in May 1911. Um, and um, the committee chairman then testified and he actually went so far as to say that Mr Carlyle's evidence so far as the committee is concerned is an invention, a pure invention, um, which is quite a strong um, way to, to, to put it. Um, Carlyle was then asked, um, well, wh why did you sign the uh, committee report? Because it could have it could have resulted in ships carrying fewer boats. And um, he, he said, well, it was not my view that they should carry fewer boats. And the question was then, well, why on earth did you sign it? And he said, well, I do not know why. I'm not generally soft. And the Attorney General said, well, I should not have thought so. And Carlyle said, I must say, I was very soft the day I signed that. Um, he seemed to be of the view that the committee merely considering additional lifeboats was progress, but actually the report he signed, um, the recommendation didn't actually go that far. Okay, so if we fast forward to uh, today, um, there's gonna be two examples of claims in the media that are, um, well, fiction, basically. So uh, I'll just start by playing a clip from a uh, Channel 4 documentary. Well, it was shown on Channel 4 in the UK, I believe in various other countries in uh, 1997. And um, uh, hopefully you'll all be able to hear it. Aidan, I'm relying on you to uh, let me know if there's a problem. Andrews also kept a small notebook in which he meticulously detailed every aspect of the construction. Modifications were made in red, a change to cornices here to light that he was there. And it's in this small book, forgotten for all these years, that a new detail in the Titanic story comes to light. Harland and Wolfe had designed both ships with not only enough lifeboats to accommodate more than three and a half thousand people, but with spare capacity for a further 65 passengers. But on the adjacent page, the portentous red ink. The lifeboat capacity for the liners had been decimated in the stroke of a pen. But on whose instructions? Okay, so uh, quite, uh, 
quite dramatic um, and probably quite convincing if you're watching a, a television programme. Uh, problem is that uh, virtually everything that the narrator has said is not true. Um, so admittedly, this notebook is um, typically referred to as the Andrews notebook. That's what it's known by. Um, but in reality, I'm not aware of any evidence that it was a notebook that he maintained. Um, it's certainly a Holland and Wolf uh, notebook uh, from uh, the drawing office, but we don't think that Andrews himself um, maintained this notebook. Andrews also kept... Um, so uh, here we have uh, extracts from the notebook. Um, it is in black and white, so uh, apologies, whereas you've seen the colour version on the telly. Um, but um, this is essentially a double page spread in the notebook. Now, if we start by looking on the right, so the right hand page, page 44, this is the page where all the lifeboats are crossed out. Um, and we can see that very clearly. Uh, they were underlined and then they were crossed out as well. Now, there's a very simple reason that they were crossed out. This is because the notebook was being updated. So the boats that are crossed out were what was fitted to Olympic in 1911. Now, by 1913, obviously with Titanic having uh, been lost, uh, they needed to fit lifeboats for everyone on Olympic. So they simply crossed out the 1911 arrangement and on the left hand page, um, which would be page 43, but um, it was uh, unnumbered, um, they added a new table which uh, described in detail the uh, lifeboat outfit that was fitted in 1913. And it was this table that the narrator referred to and specifically referenced at the bottom here, a spare capacity of 65. And we can see that contrary to what the narrator said, uh, these uh, specifications are not crossed out at all. Um, some of them are underlined, but they're certainly not crossed out. So they are um, from 1913, not before 1912. They relate to Olympics uh, lifeboats that were fitted after the disaster, not what was proposed before, and they're not crossed out at all. And um, we can just see a bit closer here. So what you can see now is the left-hand page. I've uh, um, uh, rotated it and you can see more closely um, how it breaks it down. Um, we can see on the right, it says boats originally fitted to comply with the old regulations. And then on the left, the new boats fitted to comply with the new regulations. So again, it makes it very clear, this is after the disaster, not before. And um, essentially uh, everything that um, was mentioned in the television program was, was wrong. Um, but of course, thousands of people will have seen that in the late 90s, and it's even cited to this day, you know, occasionally someone will say, well, actually, there is evidence that, you know, there was this notebook. Um, but actually, the notebook didn't show uh, any such thing. OK, um, now in 2012, um, when naturally quite a few uh, uh, media articles um, uh, were, were, were published. Um, uh, some personal papers that were written by Morris Clark, who was the Assistant Emigration Officer at Southampton, uh, came up for auction. And um, the, the content of these papers was completely, in my opinion, misrepresented in the media. Um, so as a bit of context, Clark's role was not to look at the number of lifeboats and how they complied with the law. This was something that the Board of Trade Surveyor in Belfast, Francis Carruthers did, and this was all done before the ship was completed. Um, it would have been pretty silly if the Board of Trade had allowed Titanic to leave Belfast and only said at Southampton, oh, you, you don't have enough lifeboats. That, that's just not how it worked. Um, Clark's role included overseeing muster of the ship's crew, he looked at some of the lifeboats being manned and lowered and he went over the third class passenger accommodation and uh, found it in good order. Um, now, just looking at this headline, it mentions um, having just six life boys. That's not correct. And um, the quote about um, Titanic needing 50 percent more lifeboats was attributed to Morris Clark. But in reality, 
that is something that he said after the disaster, not before. Oh, sorry. Oh dear. Hopefully we'll get them. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I keep skipping slides. I don't know why it's doing that. Sorry, I blame the computer. Um, now we can see some extracts of um, his, his notes from the media. And key here is if we look at the top, top left, under the heading boats, he's written Titanic had. So he's using the past participle. It's a, a confirmation that he was writing after the disaster, not before. And um, he, I assume, is making some notes about what he might recommend if he's asked or, or something of that nature. Um, he suggests 50% more lifeboats, um, which, which, by the way, is still way short of everyone on board. Um, he talks about um, people being transferred to another ship in one return journey, not three. So again, it's very much this mindset that you're not evacuating everyone. Hopefully help will be on the way. He even said it was not underlined advisable to boat for all hands on account of the cost. And he refers to the upkeep and also the extra manning. So the, the, the number of um, crew that would be required to man them that um, would have to be on board every voyage. Um, but he did say a sufficiency of boats for all aboard would, would uh, allay a panic. Um, now, um, there were quite a few headings within his notes and um, he refers to the boats, stowage of boats, the davits, uh, manning, um, the, the situation of the deck crew, the number of firemen, um, and how he uh, exercises his powers. Now, what he does say in general is that he would be left without support if he deviated from the regulations. And he said, I might be shifted as suggest, um, I think that should be suggested to me by owners if I enforce my views as to efficiency. Now, he's not talking, contrary to what the media reports implied, he's not talking about the White Star Line in particular. He seems to be talking about ship owners generally. Um, and indeed, that's quite logical because we, we, we've seen the statistics, the lifeboat situation was, um, was pretty similar across uh, other um, shipping lines. Um, but it, it does seem quite understandable, you know, his role is to exercise the powers that he's got. Well, quite naturally, he can't deviate from the regulations because um, he can simply enforce what is there. It's not his role to go beyond what the regulations require. Um, so, don't entirely know what uh, the context was in which he wrote that, but uh, I'm assuming it may be him getting his thoughts together um, after the disaster. Um, so just to summarize, lifeboat regulations were very updated by the uh, 1880s. We've seen there was a mindset that the best way to keep people safe was to keep a ship afloat in the first place, um, even with boats for everyone. I think that's still absolutely true. Uh, the regulations of 1894 were pretty poorly formulated. Um, I mean, they weren't really fit for purpose, even on smaller ships, let alone ships that were four and a half times the size. Um, you know, Carpathia is a, an example of that, that, you know, lifeboat capacity was not confined to larger ships as, as a problem. Um, at the time, and even today, the commentary is that ships were getting larger and larger. Again, yes, they were, but lifeboat capacity was um, on Olympic and Titanic was in line with the average of the top 20 uh, ships uh, afloat. And um, also we see that uh, Alexander Carlyle and Harland and Wolf prepared for the rules changing. They were being proactive and they, they got approval for and they fitted a new model of Welling Davits. Um, but contrary to popular belief, the, the number of boats was not finalised before Alexander Carlyle retired. Um, according to Edward Wilding's testimony, Holland and Wolfe never recommended to White Star that more boats needed to be fitted. Um, we've seen that contrary to popular belief, Olympic and Titanic actually sailed with 
significantly greater lifeboat capacity than what was originally envisaged. And um, as if we needed to know, there have been lots of misleading claims in, uh, in media reports in recent years. So it's just a question of uh, be careful what you believe. Okay, and to everyone that's still here, thanks very much for listening. <laughs> Hope you uh, found it interesting. Um, and um, I think we've got a bit of time for questions.